Just when you think that the state of California, Gomorrah by the sea, cannot become any more depraved, we get a new analysis from the Daily Mail, which shows that thousands of California pedophiles have served less than a year in prison. This on the heels of that weird Balenciaga child porn obscene kind of campaign. This obviously all in the age of Jeffrey Epstein and creepy pedo island with all of the elite, rich, prominent people all over the world. This new study has found that more than 7,000 child molesters were released within months after federal authorities sentenced them to prison. To put that in perspective, the horn hat guy got three and a half years for dancing around the Capitol. Pro-life advocates are currently facing 11 years in prison for demonstrating outside of abortion clinics. But pedos are getting off with less than a year. Unless, of course, they hung out with Jeffrey Epstein, in which case they've gotten off scot-free. Justice in America. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from Alice Siobhan. What a great name, Siobhan. I love that name. Who says, as someone who struggled with suicidal ideology for over 10 years, if I had seen that Canadian ad glorifying suicide and heard that when I was at my lowest, I might have succeeded rather than getting help. Many such cases. What's going on right now in Canada is going to kill a lot of people. That's what assisted suicide is. And uh, obviously by its very nature, it's always cloaked in the language of compassion and helping people. All it is, is killing people. It's all it is, is giving into despair. All it is, is pretty much the worst thing you can possibly think of other than the pedo stuff that's going on too. I mean, this is, this is really, really dark stuff going on in the so-called civilized West. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, okay? But we do have to protect ourselves. We've got to protect our country, our civilization. We've got to protect our homes. That's why you need ring. The holidays are upon us, and many people are traveling. I'm traveling for speeches. We're traveling to go see family. We are on the road, okay? That is why you need ring. I love ring. Ring makes me feel much, much safer. With ring security products, you can rest easy knowing that your home and your family are safe when you are not there. The Ring video doorbell notifies you when you get guests, when you get packages, absolutely fabulous. Ring's indoor cameras allow you to keep an eye on the kids and the pets while you are away. Ring alarm will alert you when there is any motion detection while the house is empty. And if you add Ring smart lighting around your home, you can turn the lights on and off while you're away, which is extremely handy. Ring's home security products do not just keep your home and family safe. They make perfect gifts for everyone on the list. I have not only received Ring products, I have given Ring products to my friends because I really, really love Ring, and I want my friends and my family to be safe as well, and it's a really good deal. Head on over to ring.com slash collections slash offers to find out how you can live a little more stress-free this season with a Ring product that is right for you. That is ring.com slash collections slash offers. There is a little glimmer of hope coming out of even America's blue cities. It seems like everything in the blue cities is just going from bad to worse to worse to worse all the way down the slippery slope. And you've seen this in uh, some of the crime statistics and footage out of Philadelphia or Los Angeles or Chicago or wherever. But if you look at New York right now, The Democrat mayor of New York, Eric Adams, has, you got to give credit where credit's due, done something that actually will likely improve the city. People with severe and untreated mental illness who live out in the open, on the streets, in our subways, in, in danger, and in need. We see them every day, and our city workers are familiar with their stories. If severe mental illness is causing someone to be unsheltered and a danger to themselves, we have a moral obligation to help them get the treatment and care they need. We can no longer deny the reality that untreated psychosis 
can be a cruel and all-consuming condition that often requires involuntary intervention, supervised medical treatment, and long-term care. This is the right policy. It could go terribly wrong. There are lots of hazards here, but this is the right policy. It is not compassionate or just or conservative to allow crazy people to die in the street, especially in cities that get very cold in the winter. Now, what you're going to hear is, I think, a legitimate concern, which is, hold on, we're giving the state power to just grab you and put you in a place involuntarily and start pop, 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 pumping you full of drugs and, and filling your head with what, whatever they want to fill it with. Uh, yes, that is a hazard. It makes us all think, especially people who are civil libertarians, I don't know, I don't want to give the government that power. That, that was one of the arguments that led to the abolition of the insane asylums in the first place in the middle of the 20th century. It hasn't worked out. There are so many crazy people who we allow to live in New York. Now, I don't think Mayor Adams is doing this necessarily because he's just had a sort of moral turn of, of heart or something like that. I think probably he's looking around saying, man, New York is going to pot. No one wants to ride the subways. No one wants to go outside. Things are looking pretty bad out there. We got to do something about the homeless. But that was, that was the reaction that Rudy Giuliani had in the 90s, and he really did clean up New York. And it is not only good for the citizens of New York, the ordinary functioning citizens of New York, it's good for the crazy people too. Now, the ideal situation would be that families are stronger, that communities are stronger, that churches are stronger, and that they can take these people in. But that doesn't always work. A lot of crazy people on the street don't have any family left anymore, or they don't want to accept help from the organizations that are offering them services and that are powerless if the, if the crazy people don't want to go. We need the power to involuntarily commit crazy people for their own good, for our good, for the common good. And this does not mean that we're now just like the left if we're going to use government power to do whatever. N no, it depends on what you're using government power for. If you're using government power for good things within their proper limits and their proper place, that's good. If you're using government power for bad things, that's bad, okay? But it is childish and morally blind to say, well, because government power can be used for a bad thing, we're not going to use it at all. That is what has led conservatives to be a completely useless force in American politics, and it's what's led to this social breakdown that we are seeing all around us. So, uh, it's kind of weird to say it, I guess a stopped clock is right twice a day. Good job, Mayor Adams, this is the right thing, and conservatives should take note. Now, speaking of New York, Back to dissing New York and the lunatic left-wingers that live there. It took them about a week. It took them longer, actually, than I thought that it would. But, but the New York Times has finally managed to make the Balenciaga child porn story an attack on conservatives. It's, it's hard for them to do that. Uh, it, obviously very hard, but they're, they're adept at it. I mean, think about how quickly you had that uh, maniac, non-binary member of the LGBT community shoot up a gay nightclub, and that was somehow conservatives' fault. You, you had all sorts of these stories, and they always managed to turn it on conservatives. This one, they were having trouble, though, because Balenciaga is beloved by liberals. The face of Balenciaga is Kim Kardashian, but so many other left-wing celebrities as well. The, the imagery was so overt. It's exactly the sort of stuff conservatives have been warning about for a long time, that the libs are peddling uh, pedophilia and Satanism. And you just saw it right there on display in the Balenciaga photo shoot. But, but now that the New York Times headline is not Balenciaga pushes weird kitty porn stuff, the, the New York Times headline is when high fashion and QAnon collide. Okay, I'm going to put a pause right there. I consider myself pretty with it. You know, I'm pretty involved in conservative politics. I've gone down a lot of rabbit trails. I have read a lot of content on the far right, on the far left. I travel around the country speaking to conservatives everywhere. I still don't know what QAnon is. Do you, do you know what QAnon is? I know it, it's something to do with elite pedos which is just true, obviously, they, like there's an island, you know, that they all went to, <laughs> that Jeffrey Epstein owned. But, uh, so I know it's something to do with that, but 
I don't, I don't know. All, the only thing that I've really ever heard about QAnon is from MSNBC and CNN and the New York Times. I am not convinced that anyone actually believes what QAnon is. I'm fairly convinced it's just a fake thing that the New York Times made up to make right-wingers sound crazy. Because what, as far as I can tell, the right-wingers look around at Jeffrey Epstein's island, and they look around at the uh, bizarre Balenciaga photo shoot, and they look around at everything in the middle, and they look around at Drag Queen Story Hour, and they look around at Trancing the Kids, and they look around at the child drag shows where the weird men are putting dollars in the clothing of the, the little kids dancing around. And we look at that and we say, hey, you guys are groomers. You guys are sexualizing children. You guys have a bizarre sexual interest in children, and that's really weird. And you also have a lot of overt satanic imagery there in the drag shows and in the Balenciaga and all. And hey, that's kind of weird, and we should stop that. And then the libs, they, they come around and they say, ha, huh, you probably, you crazy, you probably believe in QAnon. You say, well, I don't know what QAnon is. I definitely believe in all that stuff I just said, though, because I'm looking at it. Because <laughs> I, I, I saw it happen. I'm looking at it right now on the Balenciaga website. They say, oh, you, you loony, toony, crazy conspiracy theory. You're probably a QAnon. I don't know what QAnon is. I don't, but I don't, but I do know that what I just said is true and is happening. <laughs> They're like, there are court cases about it. It is for sure. There is an island in the Caribbean. You, cra- it's just a way, to, <laughs> it's just a way to paint conservatives as lunatics for observing what they were doing. And so what does the New York Times say? It says, two new Balenciaga campaigns ignited a firestorm that traveled from the internet to Fox News, fueled by allegations that the brand condoned child exploitation. Those allegations. You know those crazy allegations? After Balenciaga portrayed little kids who looked sad and in distress holding S&M teddy bears, and then in another ad campaign included references, direct references to child pornography. You know, it's just, it's so weird how it fueled all those crazy rumors. What crazy allegations that are obvious and right before our very eyes. You know, I've got an allegation to make about this economy. It's in chaos, which is why you got to check out gold. Got to check out birch gold. Right now, text Knowles to 989898. Are you a little down about the uh, lack of a red wave in the midterm elections? You're a little worried that maybe that lack of a red wave will lead to even more reckless spending and inflation and economic chaos. If you're not sure how the next two years are going to unfold, or if you are sure and you don't like the way things are looking, you got to talk to Birch Gold Group about protecting your savings with gold. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert your IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals so you can own gold and silver in a tax-sheltered account. Here's what you need to do. Very, very simple. You take out that phone. You text Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, to 989898 to claim your free info kit on gold. Then talk to one of their precious metals specialists. They will hold your hand through the entire process. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of happy customers, and almost 20 years of experience converting IRAs and 401ks into precious metals IRAs, Birch Gold can help protect your savings too. Text Knowles to 989898. Protect yourself with gold today. That is Knowles. Text it to 989898. Yeah, if you saw Balenciaga's child porn campaign, if you, if you have noticed Drag Queen Story Hour, if you notice that these weirdos are going in and, and having little kids dress up in sexual costumes and dance around at gay bars, yeah, you're, you're just an internet troll with crazy allegations, according to the New York Times. Then the New York Times writes, as online criticism of the campaign spread, the story was picked up across right-wing media outlets, including the New York Post and primetime Fox News show Tucker Carlson Tonight. The show helped pu- to publicize and mainstream QAnon, whatever that is, the, the internet conspiracy theory that a group of Satan-worshipping elites who run a child sex ring are trying to control our politics and media. Oh, that's what QAnon is? Okay, well, if that's what QAnon is, then it's just obviously true, <laughs> okay? Because I haven't seen the whole Jeffrey Epstein client book because the U.S. government's covering it up, and the U.S. government is not holding any of those pedophiles to account, and the U.S. government gave a sweetheart deal to Jeffrey Epstein himself before he got Epstein. They gave him a really sweetheart deal, and they let him live in what was essentially a condo in Palm Beach, though they called it a local jail. 
And when the U.S. attorney, Alex Acosta, asked about it, he was told, don't touch Jeffrey Epstein. He belongs to intelligence. And I know that he was palling around with the most elite, prominent, wealthy people all over the world. And they were trafficking very, very young girls to have sex with. I know that. I know that for sure. So what's the part that isn't real? Because I'm just talking about that one, the one aspect of what you're telling me QAnon. You're, that's, you're telling me that's what QAnon is. Well, if that's what QAnon is, I, I have seen that reported in the New York Times. <laughs> okay. Because even the New York Times eventually had to report on the Jeffrey Epstein story. I've seen, I've, I've seen the evidence for that. And I'm still seeing the cover up of that. And I'm still seeing weird child sex stuff all around the culture that you guys are promoting, that the New York Times is promoting in the schools in these drag shows, in libraries. And I'm still seeing a defense of the completely indefensible Balenciaga campaign. What's so amazing is the libs haven't gotten their messaging straight on this. Because the New York Times argument here is, this Balenciaga thing is a total non-traversy, crazy conspiracy theory being pushed by Tucker Carlson. And it's nothing, and it's wild. And But what did Balenciaga say? Balenciaga said, this is completely unacceptable. We're so sorry. Balenciaga wiped its Instagram account except for the apology. Balenciaga said that it is pursuing legal action against the people who put the photo shoot together. So which is it? No big deal, nothing burger, nothing to see here, says the New York Times. This is extremely serious. We're going to wipe out all of our, our branding away. We're going to get rid of this photo shoot, and we're going to sue people into oblivion for doing it. Which is it? Obviously, it's the latter. (laughs) The very fact that the New York Times keeps covering up for this. Well, it's not going to dispel any conspiracy theories. Let's let's just put it that way. Not at all. Speaking of uh, weird sex stuff, the Republicans voted last night to abolish marriage, to effectively abolish marriage, and to punish anyone who objects to the abolition of marriage. They did this through the so-called... Respect for Marriage Act. This has been a slow rolling disaster. Uh, It already started a couple of weeks ago when the Republican senators uh, voted to allow this thing to get past the filibuster so that the Democrats would only need a, a bare majority instead of 60 votes to get this bill through. The bill would enshrine the legal definition of marriage that you saw in Obergefell, that marriage is no longer a union between one man and one woman for the good of the spouses and the sake of the generation and education of children, as people have thought for all of human history. But now marriage is two people of any sex for whatever purpose. It's vaguely romantic, but it doesn't have to be. And anyway, that's what it is for now. That's the the new view. Obviously, this view is opposed by uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, reasonable agnostics in the natural law. But that's, that was the view advanced by the Supreme Court. At least for a while, you had conservatives opposing this madness. Again, it's not, no knock on gay guys. It's no attack. We've all, everyone's got gay friends. No, it's not an attack on any person. It's just an acknowledgement of reality. <laughs> acknowledgement that if marriage does not have at its core sexual difference, then it just doesn't mean anything. You, you really can't define it. It, lose, it loses its essence. It, the marriage loses its marriageness if, if it loses that fundamental aspect of it. And so at least you had the conservatives sort of kind of putting up a fight. Well, that's, that's over because these Republican senators, who was it? Roy Blunt, Richard Burr, Shelley Moore Capito, Susan Collins, Todd Young, Joni Ernst, Cynthia Lummis, that one's frustrating because I kind of like Cynthia Lummis, uh, Lisa Murkowski, Rob Portman, Mitt Romney, Dan Sullivan, and Tom Tillis. These, these guys all voted for it. Uh, they and, and not only did they vote for it, not only did you first have those 12 Republican senators who voted to set it on a fast track to being passed, but then you had certain Republicans at the last minute who were filing amendments to say, okay, look, you're going to redefine marriage. You're going you're gonna to completely squish to the Democrats. You're not going to conserve a damn thing if you're not going to conserve the fundamental institution. But please, at the very least, can you include some protections for people who object to the new definition? Can you include some protections for the many, many Christians, Jews, Muslims who 
don't want to have to be forced to participate in a gay marriage, like, like quote unquote gay marriage, like, like Jack Phillips at Masterpiece Cake Shop, who the LGBT Gestapo have hounded for years and have destroyed this man's life. And they take him to court. Even when he wins in court, they drag him to court again, because it's not enough merely to be tolerated or accepted. This, this political campaign is forcing the, anyone who objects, anyone who holds a traditional and sensible view to comply and to participate and to actively constantly affirm what is utterly incoherent. And so you had people like uh, Mike Lee, most notably, but a couple other people, Marco Rubio, and there was one other who filed amendments to say, hey, just can you at least protect the religious people here who want to follow their conscience and reason? What happened? The Democrats, of course, said, no, no, we're not protecting those religious business owners. But the Republicans said that too. The Mitt Romneys said that too. It's just pathetic. And I look at that. I know we've got the Senate race in Georgia. It doesn't matter because the Democrats control the Senate. So yeah, I'd like Herschel to win, I guess. I'd like Republicans to control the Senate, I guess. But what do, what do I care? What do I really care? These guys not only can't conserve anything, they don't want to conserve anything. Their political views are just fundamentally wrong. <laughs> okay, They are to the left of Barack Obama in 2011. What do I care? Oh, we've got, we have, this is the most important election in our lifetimes. We, we have to elect Republicans because if we don't elect Republicans, then they're not going to be able to vote for the Democrat marriage bill. And, and then we're not going to be able to say that Democrats are the real transphobes or whatever. I don't know. But if we don't elect Republicans, then only the Democrats are going to pass the Democrat agenda. But if we elect Republicans, then the Republicans will also pass the Democrat agenda. And that's why it's the most important election in our lifetimes. I don't think so. I mean, these people should be primaried, obviously. But I, I just, I don't even see the point. If any of these people came up to me and said, we, Michael, I need your vote. I'd say, okay, for what? Why do you need my vote? To do what? To do what the Democrats want more radically than they asked for 10 years ago? No, thanks. No, thank you. Don't think we need that. Speaking of certain sexual practices, uh, the World Health Organization has just come out. They're, they've got a new strong stance on monkeypox. And they're really going to do something about monkey. Well, no, they're not. They're not going to do anything about monkeypox, but they are going to change the name of monkeypox. <laughs> so they're not really going to help people who have monkeypox, and they're not really going to do anything to stop the spread of monkeypox, but they are, this is really crucial, going to change the name of it. Because the name you see is apparently very offensive. Uh, quote, in, seven, in, in several rather meetings, public and private, a number of individuals and countries have raised concerns and asked the WHO to propose a way forward to change the name. Because you see, the, the, the name of monkeypox is, is offensive. It's stigmatizing. And so uh, we, we need to change it. They're suggesting M pox. Okay, much problem solved. Good job, guys. Did it ever occur to the WHO that instead of spending all their time focused on how we talk about monkeypox, we could maybe change the behavior that causes monkeypox. Monkeypox is caused by gay orgies. That's what causes it. Outside of Zaire, the way you get monkeypox is by going to gay orgies. Not even just sex with one gay guy and you only have sex with that gay guy. You go to gay orgies. You, the way you get it statistically <laughs> is by having sex with guys who have sex with lots and lots of other guys. The WHO could very easily say, hey, fellas, cut it out. Don't do that. That's not good. That's going to be bad for you. But they could, could you imagine if the WHO said that? Oh my goodness, the reaction. There would be calls for resignations. So instead, they don't do anything to stop. It's just like the coronavirus. It's it, the coronavirus. The way to stop the coronavirus is to stop funding gain of function research and stop funding the Wuhan Institute of Virology and stop conducting this weird research that most likely, it seems, led to the outbreak of the virus. No, no, no. We're not going to do any of that. We're going to actually keep funding that research. But hey, we're going to call it COVID. We're going to call it Delta, Lambda, whatever. We're going to change the name. We're not going to change any of the behavior that, that causes these things to break out. We're going to continue to play stupid games. And we are going to continue to win stupid prizes. Now, 
For me, that, that tells me I've need, I gotta work on myself, okay? I need to be healthy. I don't wanna get these, these crazy kinds of diseases flying around. I wanna be in good health. I want my iron levels to be up. I wanna be big and burly and strong. I need good red meat. I need good ranchers. Right now, go to goodranchers.com, use code Knowles. I just absolutely love these guys. Good ranchers. I love the people that are involved. I love the way they conduct their business. And most of all, I love the meat. It is such high quality. And I am something of a meat aficionado. I don't go vegetarian for very many meals ever, okay? And I've had other meat subscription services, and I've obviously bought meat at a lot of butchers. These guys have top, top quality meat. And in most places, it's getting more expensive. And during, due to a shrinking herd, beef prices are expected to rise another 15% in 2023. The place where meat prices are not rising, incredibly, is Good Ranchers. Right now, Good Ranchers will inflation-proof your grocery bill by locking in your price for the life of your meat subscription. You don't need to get a meat subscription. You just order the meat. But if you get the subscription, it's just unbelievable. You're going to lock in that price. If that's not enough to convince you, you can take advantage of their Black Friday offer. Right now, get two 12-ounce Black Angus New York strip steaks and two pasture-raised chicken breasts free with any order when you use code Knowles. That's goodranchers.com. Use code Knowles for this special offer. Two Black Angus New York strip steaks and pasture-raised chicken breasts free with your order. Goodranchers.com, code Knowles. Good Ranchers. American meat delivered. So you've got this huge push right now from the liberal establishment. And it's it's a bigger push than even than usual. You've got the New York Times blaming conservatives for Balenciaga child pornography shoots, right? That's pretty outrageous. You've got the Republicans advancing a radical marriage law far to the left of Barack Obama in 2011. You've got You've got the World Health Organization <laughs> saying, don't worry about what actually causes any sorts of diseases or epidemics. Just, we just have to change the name. That's all that really matters. And now the cherry on top, probably the most ridiculous, least believable part of all of this. Don Lemon is insisting that CNN has never been liberal. Chris, look, he's the, he's the CEO oh, right, of right, CNN. Right. He's your boss now. Oh, he's not there anymore. He used to, he used to stand right over there. He used to stand right over there and hit the applause sign right yeah. before into commercial. Basically, all his job was. And <laughs> now he's got a really hard job, which, yeah. is, which is running CNN. The word on the street is that you guys aren't allowed to be liberal anymore. Is that, is that the case? I don't think we ever were liberal. What? Yes. I don't think we ever were that, liberal. Not me saying that. That's the people out there saying that he's not letting you be liberal anymore. Well, I, listen, I think that I think what Chris is saying is that he wants Republicans, sensible Republicans, he wants us to hold people to account, but he wants people to come on and feel comfortable with coming on and talking on, mm-hmm. on CNN and appearing on, on CNN. So if you invite someone in your house, you want to make them comfortable, but also by the, by the nature of what we do, we have to hold people to account. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going liberal or conservative or whatever. It just means that we are doing what we do and that's good journalism. That is not true. That has never been true. Forget even what Don Lemon said about CNN. I don't, I don't think we're liberal. Obviously, that's not true. Obviously, that's lying and gaslighting. But even the broader point that Don Lemon is making about journalism, look, we just hold people to account, okay? We got, that's part of our job. That's what we do. We hold pow- people to account. We speak truth to power. That is not true. CNN has never done that. We, listen, we've just got to be objective. We're not right or left. We're not liberal or conservative. That's what journalists are. We're not, we're just objective. That is not true. That has never been true. Not just, that's, that's not just the case with CNN. That's the case with all of journalism. The idea of the objective journalist who speaks truth to power is a complete fantasy that has never existed in the history of the world. <laughs> okay. Journalism is when powerful interests seek to get their message out. That's what journalism is. And occasionally, it's when not so powerful interests, like individuals with an agenda, with a perspective on the world, try to get their message out too. That would be independent journalists or alternative journalism or citizen journalism. But it all has an agenda. Journalism is always a mouthpiece for a particular worldview. There is no such thing as objective journalism. There there can't be any such thing as objective journalism because that would imply that one can be neutral about public affairs. 
while advancing a narrative about public affairs. It is not possible. There is no neutrality. And it's not just that, oh, well, too bad we can't go back to the good old days of the neutral public square. That has never existed. That was just made up. And it was basically a psyop by the liberal establishment after World War II to to establish what, what we now call, everyone calls, the left and the right, the liberal consensus. And then some conservatives came in and poked around at that and broke it down a little bit and exposed the lie and the sham that that was. So it, it, what's so offensive about this, I mean, look, maybe Don Lemon is just ignorant. Could be. I don't want to ascribe to malice that which is explained by ignorance and stupidity. But I, I don't think he's stupid. I think he's a relatively intelligent guy. And he's been very malleable over the years. When CNN has wanted him to be a little bit more moderate, he's been more moderate. When CNN has wanted him to be far left, he's been far left. So he, he clearly is able to adapt. But for, for him to say, we journalists, we speak truth to power, we're, we're objective. It's just such gaslighting. That's not what it is, okay? And it, nor should it be that. People should not just be blank automatons that view everything equally. People should not put good and evil on the same on the same level. People should not put truth and falsehood on the same level. People should not put beauty and ugliness on the same level. No, yeah, you've got to pick a side. Of course, you have to have a perspective. If you articulate any view of anything, you, you are taking a side. You're, you're, you're having a perspective. And un- unfortunately, I think it was conservatives who, who kind of bought the myth. Maybe the liberals believe their own nonsense, but conservatives bought into it too. There are many conservatives who say, oh, you know, I just kind of missed the days of Walter Cronkite. We could all trust Walter Cronkite. No, we couldn't. The man was a leftist and a member of the World World Federalist Society. The man, the man lost the Vietnam War. <laughs> Give me a break. All right. Oh, yes, neutral Walter Cronkite. He was very far on the left. Oh, we just used to have neutrality. No, we did not. Speaking of liberal things, I have to get to this. I talked about it a little bit yesterday in the member block, but I had to get to this for the, for the main show. The U.S. soccer team won the game against Iran. And I, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this. I, don't, I, I heard the news. I was giving a speech last night at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Really great to be here in uh, Steubenville, Ohio. Franciscan is a fabulous school. We had a sold-out standing room only room, and we talked about how science is fake. And you can catch the, the lecture on YouTube right now at the YAF YouTube channel. But during the Q&A, someone asked me why I don't like soccer. And I said, oh, I don't even know what happened in this game. And someone told me, said, Michael, America won. And I was crestfallen. Not because I don't want to root for the home team. Not because I like Iran. But it's just, ugh, I just, I don't like that America is in the World Cup. I think it would be much better for America. Look, I think it would be much better for the soccer players if they finally went home. You know, if their mothers came up in the minivan and picked them up and gave them a little snack and drove them home so that they could go back to their schoolwork or whatever they do. But, and I think it would be good for the country as a whole if we stopped participating in soccer. Because it, it just seems so try hard. The only people I, I can tell who pretend to like soccer in America are the sort of people who want to seem really sophisticated and cosmopolitan and European. And it's just, cut it out, guys. It's weird. No one really, it's, it's, the other problem with soccer is that it's so new. It has no history in America and it doesn't have that much history, period. Soccer only goes back to the middle of the 19th century. And so, you know, the soccer, the U.S. soccer team won and I feel very ambivalent about that. And I realize though, that the ambivalence that a lot of people feel about U.S. soccer reflects the ambivalence that a lot of people feel about U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> it occurred to me there's actually a political point here. Is a lot of conservatives are like, ah, you know, okay, all right, we're playing the game. We go, go, woo, all right, go beat Iran and whatever. And, you know, but we don't feel that strong. We we don't feel that enthusiastic about it. And it's kind of the same with foreign policy. You know, a lot of conservatives had turned on the wars in the Middle East by the time that we finally got out of there. So Joe Biden bungled it. It was a complete disaster. But there were a lot of conservatives who were happy that we got out of Afghanistan because they were asking the question, what are we doing there? What is the purpose of us in Afghanistan? It's it's not to exactly to conquer the country. It's not to impose American government on the country. We, We had a kind of puppet regime, I guess, but it wasn't 
We didn't really claim it as our own. Uh, we, were, we were instilling our values in Afghanistan, but what were those values? Pride flags and transing the kids and feminism and what, what are the, because a lot of conservatives were looking at it and saying, hold on, if those are the values that we're spreading overseas, then I don't really want to be overseas. I don't really want to be conquering the world. If conquering the world means that we're going to raise the rainbow flag in Kandahar. It's the same kind of ambivalence. All right, we're going to go beat what, the people at the soccer game at the super lib thing. I don't think so. I don't, we have to, we have to deal with this domestic crisis in America that we speak two languages, that we have two different systems of morals, that we, and, and not just we disagree here and there on certain issues, like we fundamentally view the human person and the nation in radically different ways, okay? We have to deal with that issue if we want to under, if we want to make sense of our foreign policy, what we're doing abroad, and if we want to make sense of our sports and our games and our recreation. Games and sports have always had a patriotic element to it. That, that, that goes back to ancient Greece and the Olympics. It remains true today. What is that patriotic element? What does the U.S. stand for? Until we answer that question at home, we're not going to make a lot of sense of what we're doing abroad, whether it's in Qatar on the football field or whether it's in Afghanistan with the pride flag. Speaking of corruption in our political system, bad news out of Arizona. Maricopa County has certified the vote in that bizarre, shenanigans-filled election for the midterms. The integrity of my colleagues up here on the dais and the integrity of Stephen Richer were questioned over and over and over again. And I know this is not my seat. This is the people's seat that I sit in. And one day I won't sit in this seat. But while I'm sitting here, I'm going to defend the integrity of these five men. You can think what you want to about me, but these are good men who are in public service for the right reasons. And I am proud to serve with every single one of them. Again, this was not a perfect election, but it was safe and secure. The votes have been counted accurately. And I thank everyone for their attention today. And with that, I would entertain a motion. Totally safe and secure. To counted totally accurately. How dare you even, even question that? This is a really important step in the democratic process. And yes, Lots of voting machines didn't work. And yes, lots of people were made to wait for a very long time. And yes, people were made to put their ballots in little provisional boxes. And yes, according to poll workers, no one checked to see if those ballot boxes were stuffed before anyone put their ballots in them. And yes, the poll workers observed that there were exactly 200 ballots in some cases that, that were found in addition to the number of voters who checked in that day. And yes, it took the election officials... Uh, a week, uh, now more than a week, to count the votes. And yes, it's true that even the Republican election officials who were running things in Maricopa County were avowedly opposed to Trump-backed MAGA candidates. And yes, and obviously the Democrats were opposed to them. And yes, there were election problems last time in Arizona too. And yeah, But hey, democracy prevails, huh? I don't think so. Really, really sad stuff, which is why I'm very pleased that Carrie Lake is suing Maricopa County. She really stands up firm, okay? She, that woman, she is, she's got some masculine qualities to her, okay? She's still a woman, though. She doesn't use Jeremy's razors. You should. Go check out Jeremy's razors today. Just in time for the holidays, Jeremy's razors has launched a new razor. That would be the all-new Precision Five razor with a flip back trimmer. It's got five blades, making it the perfect tool to hone your hairlines and refine your look. Precision five blades fit in the original Founders series handle. There you have it. It's so, so beautiful. So if you already bought a Jeremy's razor and you want the new Precision five blades, as I can highly recommend, look at this baby face over here. You can do that by going to the website and visiting the new self-service portal. Jeremy's razors is more than just shaving now too. Head on over to jeremysrazors.com to kick woke companies out of your bathroom. Get 30% off all Jeremy's products. That is jeremysrazors.com.
Carrie Lake is suing Maricopa County. Carrie Lake is not going quietly after this election with all sorts of problems in a place that has had all sorts of problems for a number of years now. She's not just going to go quietly. She says, quote, the filing today was basically just a way for the courts to pressure Maricopa County into giving us public records that we've been asking for. Uh, she blasted the county officials over the treatment of the election day workers, including the printer issues and the provisional boxes and the three hour lines. She says, we cannot allow an election like this to stand. I love it. I love it. I think she's terrific. I think that's great. That's exactly what Republicans should do. Which way, Western man, Carrie Lake or Mitt Romney? The, the comparison is apt because they're both facing what they consider to be lost causes. Carrie Lake is facing the lost cause of, hey, look, they're, the counties are certifying the votes. The former Secretary of State, Katie Hobbs, is going to be the next governor of Arizona. It, it's, so stop fighting. Just, go, just be polite. Just say, oh, we lost. But oh, we lost with dignity. You go away. Forget about all the election problems in Maricopa and Arizona. She's facing that lost cause. And then Mitt Romney is facing the lost cause of marriage. He's saying, look, marriage, we're going to redefine marriage. He says, look, well, I personally, I personally believe that marriage is what it has always been for all of human history until five minutes ago. But I'm not going to impose that view on other people. And I'm a really good guy. And I love them. Dem Democrats love me. I'm Mitt Romney. Got to work in my Romney impression. The problem is when I do admit Romney impression, it often sounds like Ronald Reagan. I don't, I don't want to make that comparison. But, but that's what Mitt Romney is looking at. And so he, he is trying to lose with dignity. He doesn't have any dignity doing it, but he, he wants to lose in this really, really respectable way, you know, where he, well, I'm the, I'm the opposition, but you, I guess you guys bested us. So, okay, we'll just, we'll abolish the fundamental political institution so pathetic. He's saying, look, we're going to lose, but I want to curry a little bit of favor with the libs before we lose. And Carrie Lake is saying, we're probably going to lose, but I'm going to go down swinging, okay? And I, I will take a Carrie Lake over a Mitt Romney approach any day of the week. I'm not convinced that we're going to go down. If we are going to go down, I want to go down swinging, but I'm not convinced we're going to go down. Every time I make any perfectly ordinary common sense political observation, People will say, they often say it on the marriage issue, they'll say, Michael, is this the hill you want to die on? Uh, no, I, I don't intend to die on any hills. <laughs> no, I'm not setting out to die anywhere. I mean, I will die at some point, you know, no one here gets out alive, but I don't, I'm not seeking hill, but I'm, I am going to say true things. I am going to muster, I hope even an iota of courage to stand up for those true things. And if you get me, you get me. But I don't think you're going to get me. I think most people are normal and get it. Okay. I think most people have common sense. I don't think that the perverse weirdos who who have disproportionate power in our country. I don't think the you know the the Fauci's and the Klaus Schwab's and the Balenciaga and the New York Times and all the rest. I don't think I don't think those guys have any common sense. But I think most people do. And so, yeah, we're going to stand firm and we're going to go down swinging if we have to go down, which I don't necessarily think that we will. Speaking of women fighting back, forget about Carrie Lake for a second. There is a woman, an inspiration to us all. She's suing Kraft, you know, the makers of the mac and cheese. She is suing Kraft for $5 million. And she is suing them because Velveeta Ready Mac takes more than three and a half minutes to cook. If you've ever purchased a delicious Velveeta Ready Mac, you'll know it says, eat your Ready Mac in only three and a half minutes. But this woman has found out it actually takes more than that because you've got to open the package and you've got to pour the water in, then you put it in the microwave, and then you let it sit a little bit, then you put the, the powder in, and then you stir it, you maybe let it cool a little bit. So it takes, I don't know, four minutes or something, but it's, it's more. And so she's suing Kraft for $5 million over this. Uh, the, uh, the lawyer who is bringing this case said, look, I know some people think it's frivolous, but this is false advertising. Okay, we've got to go and we're going to take them to court. This does remind me of one of the most famous lines in all of Shakespeare's plays. This comes from Henry VI, part two. Uh, and the line is, they're being asked how to, how to you know, have a good country is kind of what they're describing. What, what would they do to change the political system? And the line from Shakespeare is, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. 
straight line probably would do us uh, a lot of good as well. Obviously, it's a, a frivolous lawsuit. I don't, I don't really care. It's kind of funny. I assume it's going to be laughed out of court. But the, the problem with these frivolous lawsuits and our extremely litigious culture where uh, you know everything is so legalistic is that it actually does deprive us of our common sense. It actually does deprive us of our ability to have a good, normal society. What you're seeing here with this absurd litigious culture is is really just an expression of what you're seeing in the debate over what is a woman. It's this obtuse, uh, pedantic, legalistic kind of... uh, frivolous argumentation over things that we all know to be true. We all know that when you buy the Velveeta package, it says, get your Velveeta in three and a half minutes, and then it takes four minutes. We all know that's just what happens. It's fine. It's not a big deal. We all know what a woman is. But the culture is, well, was it three and three quarters minutes? All right, give me his, well, is a woman, what is a woman? What if someone has one X chromosome? What if someone has some ambiguity? What if someone's infertile? Is that, you know what a woman is. It's, it's the same argumentation when it comes to pornography. The argument against enforcing our laws against porn and obscenity is, well, how do you know what pornography is? I don't know, you just do. <laughs> we all just do. How about that? When Justice Potter Stewart famously, infamously, I guess, to to many people, replied when he was asked to define marriage and said, or define marriage, these days we can't even do that, when he replied uh, to a a definition of obscenity and he said, I can't quite define it, but I know it when I see it. And everyone makes fun of him and says, this is so ridiculous. That's true. Of course we know when we see it. We have faculties of reason. We have moral conscience. We we basically know the difference between true and false and good and bad and, and beautiful and ugly. But hyper-legalistic cultures are, are, are away, away from that common sense, okay? They, they blind us to that common sense. And, and uh, I don't know, I, I want to get back to a regular country where we do, in fact, know it when we see it. One of the issues is that we no longer, even as we're arguing over these little nitty-gritty words, our understanding of those words breaks down. That's, that's the additional problem here. As we refuse to take certain basic things for granted anymore, and we start squabbling over the the meaning of these words, as a part of that process, we lose our common language to the point that now we actually don't really know what a woman is, to the point that now, or, or we at least convince ourselves of that. We don't really know what marriage is, or we at least convince ourselves of that. Okay, we're going to be arguing over all of this until we're all just babbling incoherently, which I think we already sort of are. Speaking of babbling incoherently, place where a lot of that takes place would be Twitter. And there's good news out of Twitter. And it's good news that didn't even make the news, at least not for a while. Twitter has stopped enforcing its COVID misinformation policy. Misinformation policy, also known as when you post true information about COVID and the vaccines and the origins and Dr. Fauci on Twitter. And then Twitter says, this is misinformation. And it was a really, really big deal. And you could lose your account and you'd be dinged and you'd be suppressed. Well, all that went away, and what makes it newsworthy is it went away without Elon Musk even telling us that it was going away. It ju- he just quietly got rid of it. Now some people have noticed, and so they're saying, yes, it's true, effective November 23rd, Twitter is no longer enforcing its COVID misleading information policy. This is how it's done. This is how it's done. It, it, the, the way that we were able to get rid of the COVID misinformation policy was not through those loser Republican senators. I don't mean to be too harsh. Obviously, there are a lot of great Republican senators, Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, Josh Hall. I mean, there are many, many who are good. But it's not those losers who just can't muster a Republican majority. Uh, it's, not, it's not really them. It's not through some big campaign out in the public. It's just we just won a rich guy over to our side, and then he started wielding power for us. And I know a lot of people don't really like that, but that's effective. As It's been sort of a theme of this week. Money talks and BS walks. And Big Daddy Elon comes in, and he says, yeah, we're just not going to do that anymore. Twitter is my plaything now, <laughs> and we're not going to censor people for saying true things about COVID and Dr. Fauci and the vaccines and all the rest of it. And then he just does it. 
and the libs can whine and scream about it, but they don't have the power. This is, this is really the culmination of a movement you've been seeing on the right for pro- seven or eight years now, which is a movement away from the idea that wielding power is bad. This hyper-individualist idea, don't, you know, don't wield any power. We don't want to be authoritarians or whatever. And uh, a movement toward, no, we obviously have to wield power. We've got very powerful people wielding that power against us. We need to wield our power too. Good lesson. I want to see a lot more Elon Musks, okay? I want to see a lot more Elons. I want to see a lot more of the handful of Republican senators pushing back. Let's do it, baby. Let's do stuff. Or you deserve to lose your seat and you should have very little role in public life. All right, we need, we need to be led out of our present bondage, okay? And when you want, and I'm not talking about bondage like the Balenciaga thing. I'm talking about bond, you know, bondage like slavery, okay? And when you want to watch a fabulous show about one of the all-time great narratives of being led out of bondage, you've got to check out Exodus. Exodus with Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Last Friday, we released the first two episodes of the brand new biblical series by Jordan. That is Exodus. This follows up on his Genesis series, which was one of, if not the most popular piece of content Jordan ever put out. Uh, Now we've got this amazing Exodus series with people like Dennis Prager, Jonathan Peugeot, many, many more new episodes releasing weekly. You do not want to miss it. Check out the trailer. The Hebrews created history as we know it. You don't get away with anything. And so you might think you can bend the fabric of reality and that you can treat people instrumentally and that you can bow to the tyrant and violate your conscience without cost. You will pay the piper. It's going to call you out of that slavery into freedom, even if that pulls you into the desert. And we're going to see that there's something else going on here that is far more cosmic and deeper than what you can imagine. The highest ethical spirit to which we're beholden is presented precisely as that spirit that allies itself with the cause of freedom against tyranny. And yes, there, there exactly. Is that I want villains to get punished. But do you want I, the I, villains to learn before they have to pay the ultimate price? That's such a Christian question. <laughs> I love Dennis so much. (laughs) All those guys are absolutely fabulous. The series is really great. You should go check it out. And to do that, you got to become a Daily Wire member. The other reason you got to become a Daily Wire member, that is how you join our little inner circle here, okay? That is how you join the member block that is not for you hoi polloi out there just in the ether, okay? That is for the creme de la creme who show up to the Daily Wire member section. I feel I feel distant from the Daily Wire member block right now because I'm on the road. I'm in the middle of nowhere in Ohio. And so uh, today we will be discussing all manner of things intimately, directly with our Daily Wire members. If you want to become one, head on over right now. The show continues now. We see you at the member block.